Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From One King West Hotel in downtown Toronto, welcome to the Empire Club of Canada. For those of you just joining us through either our webcast or our podcast, welcome to the meeting. Before our distinguished speaker is introduced today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our head table guests. I would ask each guest to rise for a brief moment and be seated as your name is called. And please, audience, refrain from applauding until all of the head table guests have been introduced. So first, of course, we have our guest speaker today, Mr. Andy Byford, the Chief Executive Officer, Toronto Transit Commission. Mr. Pat Patrick O'Neill, Vice President, Mobility Division, Siemens Canada Limited. Ms. M.J. Perry, PhD student theology, vice president and owner, Mr. Discount Limited, and a director of the Empire Club of Canada. Mr. Remy Landry, vice president, major projects, rail and transit construction, SNC-Lavalin. Mr. Jack Simpson, director, generation and capacity planning, Hydro One. Mr. Josh Cole, chair, Toronto Transit Commission. Mr. Michael Cobbsar, Director, Sales, Ontario, Siemens Canada Limited, and a Director of the Empire Club of Canada. And my name is Barbara Jessen. I'm the President of Jessen and Commun Company Communications and the President of the Empire Club of Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, your head table guests. I was riding the number two to Bay Station just a few days ago when I overheard a conversation between a young man and a woman. With an increasingly colorful vocabulary, the young man was drawing comparisons between public transit in Toronto and his hometown, pointing out the frequent delays and interruptions in Atlanta's service. The young lady he was with, preoccupied as she was with her phone, mumbled with dis disinterest something like, yeah, I hate it when we have delays here too. The conversation continued to resonate as I thought about our lunch today. Specif specifically, the word that stuck out to me is when. When we have delays, she said. The inconsistency and inefficiency that characterizes the commuting experience so for so many North Americans has diminished significantly for TTC riders in Toronto. By all metrics, the TTC is excelling. Delays and rider complaints are down. Rider satisfaction and on-time performance are up and new fare systems and infrastructure have made it easier to get people where they want to go. From a period of relative inf infamy in the early 2000s, the TTC has emerged as a global transit leader recognized only months ago as the best public transit agency in North America. Please note that when I offer this praise, I am not addressing infrastructure. That is a whole other discussion, but given the hand he was dealt, our guest today has moved mountains and he has done it with transparency and commitment. I organize my mornings, morning routine accompanied to CBC's Metro Morning, and I'm always impressed by the fact that Mr. Byford is there frequently, taking knocks on the chin, explaining delays, offering reassurances, reassurances and updates, and providing frank, honest responses to criticism. While Tor Torontonians refuse to abandon the time-honored tradition of TTC bashing, the reality is that our guest has given us a transit system that is the envy of other major North American centers. The realization of an effective and efficient and most of all safe transit system could not be more timely as transit has never been more important in our urban centers. Our guest today may be leaving the TTC, but rest assured his efforts have put a system in place that is well equipped to meet these challenges and carry our city forward into the future. We are privileged to be joined today by Mr. Andy Byford, CEO of TTC since 2012. For years, Mr. Byford has led the largest transit agency in Canada and the third largest in North America, carrying over 540 million riders on an annual basis. Over his time with us, he has been responsible for the delivery of safe, punctual, reliable bus, streetcar, SRT, subway, and wheel trans services. From 2009 to 2011, Mr. Byford delivered service to a million customers a day on Australia's largest transit network as Chief Operating Officer of Rail Corporation in Sydney. From 2003 to 2009, he held the positions of Operations Director and Operations and Safety Director with UK Railway and Southeastern Trains Limited UK. Please join me in wel welcoming Mr. Byford to our podium. Thank you. 
So, good afternoon, everyone. First uh, challenge is to make sure that I say what an honor it is to be standing here at the Empire Club of Canada. And for those of you who weren't here the last time I was here, when I got up and said, uh, it's great, an, a great honor to be here at the Canadian Club, uh, I'm so glad to have got over that first hurdle. <laughs> it's all these maple leaves, they threw me, right? But no, it's great to be back at the Empire Club. And not least, uh, to be back in this fabulous room where uh, not so long ago I was uh, very proud to be awarded the, um, the, the IABC's uh, award for the Communicator of the Year, which my very good friend uh, and colleague Brad Ross put me up for, which I think uh, actually you were a more worthy recipient of that. But that also was in this beautiful room. So Brad, um, I hope in my few words today uh, I've proved worthy of that award. And, and you'll notice I'm not standing at the dais today because I just thought what might be more interesting is rather than me read out a speech, um, is actually to talk about 10 seminal phone calls that have really framed my time here at the TTC. Uh, but just a bit about, you know, in some ways, about how I uh, got to be here on stage today. MJ, one of the most persuasive people I know, apart from my wife, uh, was um, saying to me from the start of the year, we must get you back to the Empire Club. And um, at the time, when I accepted this uh, honor of uh, talking to you again, I did not know that I would be going to New York. So in many ways, um, the, the, the coup for you is you get my swan song and in what's going to be a very busy next few weeks. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's 10 things I want to just talk about. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces in the room, although I'm somewhat thrown by the fact that my boss, Chair Josh Cole, is here, and one of my commissioners, and forgive me if there's any others in the room, uh, Commissioner Joe Mahevic. So I'm going to have to revise what I was going to say uh, somewhat <laughs> radically. <laughs> um, but no, Josh and uh, Joe, thanks for coming. So. Um, Okay, so 10 seminal calls. Uh, and some of this is, is probably uh, familiar territory to you, but then I'll get on to the more re uh, interesting recent stuff. So call number one would have been the call that brought me here in the first place. I was in Sydney, enjoying life, trying to avoid uh, being stung or eaten or bitten, um, and uh, got the call to come to Toronto. And, and I've never regretted that call. You know, every time I go back to Australia, I've been back a couple of times. I love the place. You know, as soon as you walk, as soon as you arrive at um, the uh, airport in Sydney, you, you feel like you're back home. It's a great place. But, uh, but I've been back a few times and don't regret it at all. This has been the most exhilarating, um, uh, meaningful, at times frustrating six years of my professional career. But ultimately, I've loved every minute of the past six years. But I think back to why I took this job. And I took the job for uh, three primary reasons, which again, I, I may have mentioned before. Number one, uh, happy wife, happy life. My uh, wife, happy life. My wife wanted to uh, come back to Canada. She's from, uh, she's from uh, Ottawa, uh, so she's Canadian. Um, but the two primary reasons were, number one, I really wanted to stretch my own uh, experience. I'm a railwayman by background, as you heard from the kind introduction. And, and I wanted to expand my knowledge to the five modes that we have here at the TTC. But the main reason for coming was because I did see a golden opportunity here. I saw an excellent company that had been run uh, by really illustrious predecessors, uh, other chief general managers before me, and who had, who had bequeathed to me a very good legacy. And I walked in uh, to a position of number two, actually. I was the chief op operating officer, if you recall, uh, take, uh, taking the position that was, um, uh, to which I was appointed by Gary Webster, who was the chief general manager at the time. Gary brought me in because he recognized it was his, uh, it was his call, uh, so that's a big call. He knew that uh, something needed to be done about customer service at the TTC. And um, so uh, that's what I set about doing as the uh, chief operating officer. And, and those, those were the uh, very interesting first three months, gauging what needed to be done, having a look, to look at what worked, what didn't work, and, and planning out really what, what I was going to do when, if, I got the, uh, got the, the permanent job of uh, Chief General Manager when Gary retired. Uh, well, that was the plan. Uh, that was supposed to be what happened, one year of shadowing Gary and then take over after that. But of course, as you know, uh, that didn't, that's not exactly how it panned out. After just three months, uh, I was elevated to the top position of uh, acting Chief General Manager to begin with, then subsequently renamed as Chief Executive Officer. And what I'd seen, though, in that first 
three months as the COO was uh, that there was way more to do, way more to do than the challenge I thought I was coming into. For starters, and, and I suspect these words will come back to haunt me, I'd never been in such a political environment as Toronto. Well, uh, people have already said to me, wait till you get to New York, where um, at least politicians get on here, generally. Uh, it's going to be quite the, um, the political challenge when I get south of the border. Um, but I, I'd seen enough to know that we needed to do way more than the, the obvious things. I mean, we, we did various things. We, we uh, undertook a quick wins program, cleaned up the subway, cleaned up the, uh, the, the trains so that they didn't have garbage going up and down all day. We tidied up the collector's booths. Um, you know, we did a lot of uh, work in terms of uh, introducing debit and credit facilities in, in collector booths, which was kind of crazy that up to that point you couldn't do that. So there's a lot of um, what I would call quick wins. But I think what really struck me in that first three months was the fact that the, the, the real challenge was way bigger than that. Again, building on Gary's excellent work and that of people like uh, the legend that is David Gunn, uh, so a couple of G chief general managers before him, and it was obvious that what was really needed was a comprehensive top to bottom modernization of the TTC. So that would be um, really uh, call number two. So the first call was coming to Toronto in the first place. The second call, um, in somewhat traumatic circumstances, was the call that Gary and I received from a committee room at City Hall saying that Gary was out and that I was going to be put into an acting position. And that was a very difficult time, obviously, uh, for poor Gary, uh, but it was a very difficult time for me also because I thought I had the luxury of, of a year shadowing my former boss to get to know who's who, what's where. I didn't even really know the system. And for Gary, it was the end of a, a wonderful 37-year career, and it should never have been ended like that. But, you know, we are where we are. Uh, I uh, was elevated to the top position and uh, set about with my team, my executive team, um, we knew that what we needed was a comprehensive modernization plan because, remarkably, there was no such document. There was no corporate plan. So we put it together. It was going to be a five-year plan to deliver a transit system that makes Toronto proud. That was the vision we came up with. Uh, we put together a series of key performance indicators to keep you, uh, the customers, apprised of what we were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Warts and all, even if we had a bad day, you get to see what the statistics were like. And this plan was built around seven uh, key objectives uh, to tackle every single part of what was a good but somewhat old-fashioned company. So effectively, uh, the way I describe it is we were addressing three key needs. We were in, uh, upgrading infrastructure, uh, which in many ways was very old-fashioned, old 1950s signaling on, on quite a major part of Line 1, uh, very old streetcars that were beginning to see the end of their working lives. The SRT, Scarborough Rapid Transit, scheduled for uh, replacement, uh, well, more on that later. Um, and uh, streetcars that were, were to, a, uh, to a certain extent, held together with duct tape, literally, by what I call my miracle workers. So a lot needed to be done, and that plan needed to address an overhaul of infrastructure. Processes were steam-driven. They were the most archaic uh, processes behind the scenes, so no wonder the company couldn't be as dynamic as it wanted to be in terms of offering excellent customer service. And the prevailing culture, the third challenge, the prevailing culture was a very militaristic, top-down, hierarchical, uh, male-dominated, white male-dominated structure that had um, seen the company well in previous years but was by no means fit for purpose. Uh, back in 2011. So, so th th that was really what we set out to do um, over the, uh, in, in that second call, an absolute uh, focus on modernizing the TTC. And in doing that, also embracing five mega projects, a new streetcar fleet, ATC, automatic train control, um, building the Spadina subway extension, rolling out Presto, and uh, um, embracing that new culture. So uh, that's what we set about doing. Um, so uh, as my, I got into my job, the, uh, the, uh, it was obvious to me that, that, that this was not going to be as easy as I thought because, yes, we got the plan. Yes, um, we're starting to make some difference and, and get some positive feedback with the various quick wins that we'd undertaken. Uh, but already I started to fall foul of uh, and encounter uh, the um, politics of the day. So I guess uh, call three uh, of a, uh, that defined my time at the TTC would be various calls from uh, former 
uh, re Mayor Rob Ford, rest in peace. And, and I got very used to uh, phone calls at 2 a.m., even 3 a.m. from the mayor, who, to be fair, was advocating for his uh, constituents. So, so often my phone would ring, uh, my wife would say, don't tell me, it's Rob Ford. And sure enough, uh, he'd come on the phone, and I'll always remember, he would always say to me, uh, hi Andy, it's Mayor Ford, it's, sorry, hi Andy, it's Rob Ford, Mayor of Toronto. And I'm like, I do know who you are. <laughs> What do you want? It's 3 a.m. But invariably, he would say to me, buddy, because he'd always call you buddy, he'd say, hey, buddy, uh, I've got, I'm standing at the corner of X and Y, and I've got someone here who wants to know where their bus is. Can I put them on to you? Yes, Mr. Mayor, put them on. Uh, and invariably, um, so, so the person would say, well, I've been standing here for 10 minutes, and my bus still hasn't got here. How the hell am I supposed to know where that bus is? So um, one thing I've learned in 28 years of working in transit is the art of winging it. So what you would do is just say, oh, yes, uh, we, we have just had a bit of a problem on that route. Uh, there was a traffic accident. It will be with you in five minutes. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> and of course, the mayor was very happy with me because I'd bothered to take the call. And, and then, of course, the other big uh, call from the mayor was uh, Football Gate. We all remember that, uh, where uh, there was all the big con controversy about taking the, uh, the bus uh, from the football field, where there'd been a big punch up between uh, the mayor's team and another team, and we were ordered uh, to uh, get, a get, get a couple of buses to take the football team back to uh, Del Bosco, Don Bosco, is that what it's called? Yeah, Don Bosco School, um, which of course then caused a massive uh, political row. And I remember thinking, I'd only been here a short time, and I remember thinking, how the hell have I got caught up in this big row about a football team and a bus? When initially I had no idea what the mayor was talking about when he asked me where the bus had got to. Now, to be fair, he didn't ask for it, it was the police that had asked for it, uh, but anyway, uh, I just remember struggling somewhat um, with uh, how I was gonna answer that to the media, who obviously wanted to know was I complicit in ordering that bus, which I was not. Then, um, so that's call number three. Call number four, and these are the calls that, that you, you never want to get. There were certain calls uh, that I got from transit control, and one of the things I was just saying to my lunch guest was, um, when I finish at the TTC, I will have a brief period, it will be a wonderful period, of four weeks before I go to New York with no phone. That's gonna be so nice. Uh, not least because you're not getting calls about this and that, but also because as a, um, as a transit CEO, you never forget that you are the person ultimately with that accountability and you dread certain calls. And in my time at the TTC, I have taken very difficult um, and disturbing and tragic calls. We um, had just a week into my tenure, if you remember, one week into my tenure, uh, I got a call from Transit Control saying uh, a collector has just been shot through the window at DuPont Station. And that's the kind of call you don't want to get. Uh, what do you do? You mobilize straight away. So I was straight off to DuPont, check on, um, a quick check to see what was happening, find out the facts, straight off to the hospital. The good news is that collector survived and, and he's well on, the road, well on the road to recovery. Um, call number two, I remember, from transit control was the much, uh, or, or the infamous punami down at, um, down at Union Station where a wall of foul water hit the uh, contractors because they'd managed to go and uh, break a water main and that flooded Union Station. Um, and then since then we've had two further calls, that the, again the kind of calls you don't want to take with tragedies involving colleagues of mine at Yorkdale and then subsequently at Macowan Station. So. Um, Ultimately, they're the calls you don't want to take, uh, but certainly I would see them as, as also being calls that define my time here. Um, and what that did, did do for me more than ever, and I say this as an ex-safety director uh, at one of my former companies, it reinforces more than ever the need to never, ever relax. And uh, Peter, uh, Peter Slowly there knows as a former chief uh, police officer, senior police officer, uh, they, they, you can never relax on that kind of thing. And I know certainly going to New York, uh, the, the, the specter of the worst possible call and a major incident or some kind of terrorist attack is something you never forget about. You always, uh, you're always mindful of the need to exercise due diligence. The next two calls uh, are really, or the next calls, uh, there's two of them under what I'd call call five, would be um, big calls that we made. 
So the first one is very topical because in just 13 days, the Toronto York Spadina subway extension will open, the Line 1 extension up to York University and to York Region. And it's no exaggeration to say that it is just stunning. Wait till you see it. Six new stations, 8.6 kilometers of track, and not any old stations. These are Wi-Fi, Presto, cell-equipped stations. And the train service itself will be the new automatic train uh, signaling system that we've been progressively installing on the uh, west side of the uh, Young University Spadina line. So even now, today, we've got ghost trains running, and the trains are being driven by the press of a button. Um, you wait till you see that, TYSSE. It is just stunning. But uh, the big call was, a, was, of course, back in 2015, when I had to take the very difficult uh, decision to remove the project management team and bring in Bechtel, who are an American uh, construction company. That will prove to be the best decision of my professional career, because without that change, the TYSSE was headed for, at best, quarter four 2018, more likely quarter one of 2019. So bringing in Bechtel to work with the existing management team and to really focus on getting a 2017 finish, which to me was the only acceptable alternative, uh, that, will, uh, have, that, that decision will stand the test of time. And again, you wait till you see it. Come along and have a look. Uh, December 17th, 2017. Um, and then on that same vein, another big call was actually made by one of my uh, chief officers, uh, Mike Palmer, who's the COO, and that was a call to, uh, to say time out. Time out on the signaling system that was being installed, which was um, hopelessly overcomplicated in the way that it had been set up some years back. Far too many contractors, far too many uh, com complex interfaces, and that again was a project that was heading for big trouble, was not going to deliver um, the scope, and it was not going to deliver on time on budget. So we simplified things, uh, we uh, simplified the contracts, and Alstom, who are now our basically primary contractor, um, will deliver that signaling system to TYSSE on time and on budget, and then we'll finish the job off by going round to Finch by the end of 2019. Um, and I think that's a real achievement because that project, again, was in big trouble. And also, uh, this will be the first major brownfield installation of this system anywhere in Canada. It's a real triumph to do that and to overlay that on an existing railway. Never easy. Okay, so the next one is, uh, this was, so th those were big calls we made. The next one was a call I made. And this was somewhat controversial uh, because the, uh, probably the most complex and enduring and controversial issue I've dealt with is, guess what, the Scarborough subway. And uh, that has been a, um, a bit of an albatross around my neck in many ways because everyone has such um, uh, uh, polarized views. Should it be an LRT? Should it be a subway? And I found myself in my tenure uh, accused of uh, having misled uh, council, which is a very, very serious accusation to be made against a public servant, and one that cut to the quick um, of everything I believe in uh, and, and, and wounded me terribly because uh, that's just not who I am. I would never, ever set out to mislead council. And what, but what we did was we prepared for a council debate where the, it was obvious that there was going to be some uh, resurrection of a discussion about should it be a, a subway or should it be an LRT. So what I'm going to say is, for the record, absolutely, and, and funny enough, my chief of staff is here in the room with us, uh, people still to this day say that, um, the, uh, that the briefing note was prepared for the mayor. No, it wasn't. The briefing note was prepared for me by my chief of staff, period. Now, there, are, there were problems with the way the note was subsequently disseminated, but that was not um, any, in any way Machiavellian or conspiratorial. We've learned a lesson from that. But that was the, probably the low point of my TTC career. I could, not, I could not believe it when I read the paper and found that I was being accused of misleading counsel. So my big call, uh, that big call, was the very ne that day of, uh, of reading that in the paper, I called the ombudsman, which is unprecedented, because I was phoning her, you know, the person you don't want to mess with. I was phoning the ombudsman to say, I'd like you to investigate me. 
Why? Because I was super confident, totally confident, that not only would I personally be vindicated and exonerated, but that the TTC had absolutely nothing to hide. Uh, that, that request of the ombudsman wasn't, uh, um, wasn't agreed to because she felt it was outside her jurisdiction, and you know the rest. The AG subsequently got involved, the AG investigated it, and did indeed duly exonerate the TTC. So we, yes, we made some mistakes, but there was no malicious intent, um, and I'm glad to say that I can leave uh, this city and head off to New York uh, with that having been cleared. Okay, so uh, we're on to call seven then, and there's been lots of these calls. Anyone here from Bombardier? <laughs> no? Okay, but I'm aware that the cameras are rolling. We have had lots of phone calls, as you might imagine, with Bombardier uh, on the much vexed subject of our streetcar order. So we currently have 51 of these wonderful beasts running up and down through uh, town, particularly going very well through King Street, actually. Thank you, Chair, for your support and leadership on that. Um, so that, this has been where, where the, the Scarborough subway was probably the most um, concerning and, and troubling uh, time of my tenure. Without question, the new streetcar order has been the most frustrating because the sad thing is they are fabulous vehicles. The customers love them. They do a great job. They carry the masses. They're presto equipped. They're air conditioned. They're low floor, so they're accessible. But we just can't seem to get them uh, built but to the right quality level, and we can't seem to get them built to the right um, quant uh, quantity. Anyway, we'll get there. Uh, by the end of the year, we're supposed to have 65. We'll see about that. Uh, I'll be talking to um, the, uh, board, my board next week about what, the, what we think the end-of-year uh, end figure will be. But ultimately, the one thing I'm proud of is the fact we have never let Bombardier off the end date. By the end of 2019, all 204 vehicles will be uh, introduced into service. So obviously the, the challenge for Bombardier is it gets ever harder. As you're running out of time on a fixed time frame, you've got to build even more, even more quickly. So that's their problem. That's their challenge. And what we've been pushing for is now that they're not building um, uh, LRT vehicles for, uh, for, for Metrolinx, now that they're not building thank goodness, subway cars for um, New York City Transit, uh, they will have plenty of spare. That's going to get me into trouble, right? Uh, scrub that. They will not have. Uh, they will not have um, the. Uh, they won't. They will have spare capacity at Kingston. So we've already said. Well, why can't you put on an extra production line at Kingston? So we'll see. But to be fair to uh, Bombardier, once they get it right, they really get it right. We do also have Bombardier trains. The rocket trains on line one are uh, delivering Asian standards of reliability. So they can get it right. I just need them to do it more often. Three more calls. Uh, next one, calls from the union. Things that we have done that are controversial but were the right things to do. So we did bring in uh, new work practices. Remember I said the work practices were somewhat archaic. We brought in one person train operation on our line four, Shepherd. Uh, we brought in um, uh, contracting out. So we've contracted out cleaning of washrooms, garbage collection, bus service lines. Again, highly controversial, but I felt the right thing to do. And the most controversial of all, random drugs and alcohol testing, which is the norm in the UK, in Australia, where I'm going in the US. Uh, but that is highly contentious. But I stand by what we've done. It was the right thing to do. Uh, again, back to that former safety director in me, if you know that there is something going on and you don't act on it, that is guilty knowledge. If you do not take a duly diligent approach to things, that is a go to jail card. So we, we knew that there were issues, only a tiny, tiny percentage of staff, most of them are good as gold, uh, but we could not ignore that. So I'm proud of the fact that we did tackle those and other difficult issues uh, during my tenure. Call number nine was a call that I kind of dreamt of for five years. When, when we launched the corporate plan, um, there was a bit of kid psychology involved because call, uh, what we said at the time was, if we cut out the silly stuff, if we up our game, and if we pull together as one team, this was to 83 employee town halls of a somewhat skeptic work, skeptical workforce who initially were like, who's this guy? What's he know? He's only just got here. But what he said was, if you do those three things, cut out the silly stuff, up our game, and, uh, and uh, improve performance, pull together as one team, we can get the TTC back to being number one in North America. Uh, and, and that's the prize. And, and we came very close, actually, to winning that in 2016. Minneapolis won. And I have to say, I said to my exec, I'm not being funny, if Minneapolis can win it, we can win it. Uh, it's a way bigger property. And um, so the, the day we got the call from 
um, from APTA to say we'd won the Outstanding Transit of the Year Award was the absolute highlight of my time at the TTC. Not for personal satisfaction, but I wanted it for the frontline staff, the much maligned TTC staff who work day in and day out and for whom or against whom the criticism is just relentless. So we wanted it for them. Uh, I'm so proud that we, that we won that award for them. Um, there was a lot of scoffing in, the, in various uh, parts of the media and parts of the city, and to be fair, some skepticism on the part of our traveling public. But as Brad rightly pointed out, APTA do not award for perfection, they award for action. And what they said was, over the last five years, you and your team have performed um, uh, uh, you know, sterling work in tackling all of these various issues and in modernizing the TTC. That's why we want it. Um, and I sent a note to my staff to say, don't be demoralized by the reaction. Are our customers happier? Yes, record customer satisfaction. Are the staff more engaged? Yes, because we measure that too. And do our peers think we're doing a good job? Well, clearly yes, because they voted for it. So I said, ignore the scoffing, let them scoff away. We deserve that award. And the best thing for me was the fact that we also did a vox pop of all of our, a load of our employees, not top managers, not senior top brass, but janitors and collectors and operators and mechanics. And we asked them one simple question. How did you feel when you heard that, that TTC had won the APTA Outstanding Transit of the Year Award? And without, um, without a single exception, they said they, they were just puffed up with pride, that they, uh, it was uh, finally the TTC was getting some recognition and finally someone was appreciating the job that they do day in and day out, which is why when I went down to Atlanta, I dedicated that award to them. It's their award. So then that takes me full circle. Call number 10 is the call from New York. Um, so I am truly poignant about leaving. Uh, I've loved every minute of working here in Toronto. It's been an honor to lead the TTC, and it has been um, an honor to serve you, the people of Toronto. Um, I've, I've been lucky in that I've got a great team. Um, a number of my executives are here today. The TTC is just, it's a phenomenal organization. It's a much maligned organization and a much misunderstood organization. But I'm also lucky in that I've, um, I've had supportive board members. I've also had three chairs who've always backed me, Karen Stintz, Maria Roger Mary, and now Josh, Josh Cole, um, on whose watch uh, this company has, has introduced something like a thousand new vehicles. We're really making uh, progress. So Josh, thank you, and to uh, Commissioner Mahevic, thank you for all the support. Um, it's been interesting seeing what people say when they hear I'm going to New York. The general reaction is either congratulations or are you completely nuts? Are you sure you know what you're doing? Um, but I'm going really for two reasons. Number one, because it's nice to end on a high record customer sat transit of the year and the soon to be open Spadina extension, which really will be such a triumph when we get that thing open. Um, but also number two, uh, you know, any transit professional really aspires to to, 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 to do one of the big three jobs, I'd say, Hong Kong, London, or New York. And New York aren't gonna ask twice. So um, in closing, I am looking forward to it. Um, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes down there. So, the way I look at it, someone's gotta do it, right? It's the biggest, toughest uh, challenge in transit right now. Someone's gotta give it a go. Um, so hopefully it's, um, it's the guy with the funny accent uh, who's gonna go in. I don't know what they'll think of uh, having a a, a limey, tell them what to do, but um, I'm quite looking forward to it. So it's been my honor and a privilege, and uh, Madam Chairman, it's been an absolute honor to once again speak before this august institution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Byford has agreed to take, drive a mic. Mr. Byford has agreed to take some questions from the audience. And uh, there we go, one down here. We've got the mic there. Uh, Mr. Bradford, uh, the TTC is a unique organization that still doesn't contract out a lot of their work. You still have your own, contract, your own uh, carpenters, your tile setters, um, gardeners, and a lot of organizations would find it strange that, uh, that you'd, you'd employ people to do that rather than co contract it out. If maybe you could talk about 
um, the culture the, or the, the theory behind doing it that way. Sure. So, um, I mean, we have contacted some things out. Again, it was highly controversial. That was done as part of the, well, actually, it was in the run-up to the 2014 CBA, Collective Bargaining Agreement. Um, and at the time, I took the view that there are some things that are core business, uh, which are clearly moving people from A to B on safe, reliable, well-maintained infrastructure and vehicles. Um, and some things just, to me, aren't core business. Cleaning washrooms isn't exactly our core business or picking up garbage. Probably the most controversial uh, item was we, so we contracted out what are called the bus service lines, where the buses are brought in at the end of the day, uh, they are fueled, they are uh, swept out, and then they are washed and, and lined up ready for the next day, and that is actually contracted out. But um, I, I don't know, I mean, you, uh, at the end of the day, the, it may seem like an odd model. There are advantages to, know, to being able to, to call upon your own in-house uh, resource. And what I would also say is a lot of these people are highly motivated and very capable at what they do. So um, I think it's a challenge for, for the future, maybe for my successor, to again look at uh, what you might call a make or buy decision. Um, but what I would say is we've got people in different um, sections of the TTC who truly excel at what they do. Um, so I, I certainly don't think contracting out en masse is a panacea. I think it's the kind of thing you do on a one-for-one on a, um, -one basis. You, know, you look to see what the individual case is. Any other questions? Oh. Mm -hmm. What would be your uh, recommendation to your, uh, your successor and, and the city in general? Where, where do you see the TTC and transit uh, in the GTHA uh, moving in the next five, 10 years. Okay, so um, specific advice to my successor, whoever that may be, would definitely be uh, to, to, I would like that, I, I hope that the course that we've pursued as an executive um, is maintained. I think you've failed as a leader if when you leave, the culture slides back to how it used to be. And we've really put a lot of work into culture change, into um, focusing on good people, not letting bad people off the hook, the, you know, the errant few, uh, but to, um, to recognize and to reward uh, quality people of whom there are many. And um, we've, we've tackled a lot of issues around diversity. We've, we've uh, now got six women on our executive. There'd never been a woman on the executive five years ago. It's now six and six on merit. So I definitely hope that the, the, the change, the culture change where you look to catch people doing things right rather than catch them doing things wrong uh, is maintained because there's only one way to deliver world-class service and that is through motivated uh, people who want to do a good job, not through coercion uh, because that's often been tried in various uh, transit place, uh, companies I've worked, the big stick way of managing. It doesn't work, it does short term, uh, that's not how you get sustained improvement. So I definitely advocate whoever takes over, please maintain that uh, approach because I think it's working. That's one of the reasons we have very high levels of customer sat. Um, and then secondly, keep the pressure on about uh, what, two things. One, um, relentless attention to detail and relentless work on um, improving the underlying infrastructure. So keep maintaining track, keep renewing drains, keep renewing HVAC. You know, as uh, Josh once said, it's sort of the unsexy stuff that doesn't get a photo op, but you've got to do it and, and modernizing the TTC in that respect. And then secondly, keep um, advocating for expansion. We need a waterfront LRT. Uh, we need to uh, get um, a solution for Scarborough. You know, the, the Scarborough subway is being taken to the 30% uh, design mark. The SRT will not be able to keep going forever. Um, and then finally, keep uh, advocating for a relief line, which I've said since the day I got here is a priority for the TTC. That's got to happen, or even with rocket trains and ATC signaling, even with the additional capacity that brings. By 2031, Young and Bloor will be unable to cope. Andy, I wonder uh, if you'd care to comment on the recent Toronto Board of Trade proposal that there should be one giant transit uh, agency covering all of the GTA. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's practical and, and what would the advantages, disadvantages be right. as far as you're concerned? Okay. So don't forget my background is um, London Underground and the tube comes under what is called Transport for London. So uh, the concept is familiar to me um, and actually where I'm going, New York City Transit is one of five agencies that come under the MTA, which is the Metropolitan Transit, uh, uh, Transit um, Agency. 
um, authority, sorry. So um, I think you know, there, there are models for that, and there are some advantages to that, because you can, um, you can get economies of scale and, and uh, look to have a standard ticketing, standard um, uh, um, scheduling, uh, standards, standards, common standards in terms of uh, quality of service to be offered, common standards in terms of signage. You know, all those things can be achieved with one overarching um, organization. And certainly, I think Transport for London has done a really good job in that respect because it truly does pull together all of the constituent parts of a transportation system, i.e., not just transit, um, and it does so well. However, um, I don't think people should be fooled by just saying, well, that's the answer to all the problems. Because as, as I said on Metro Morning this morning, uh, to me, the issue right now for the TTC isn't really about governance, it's about funding and long-term sustainable funding. And bear in mind, the TTC, for all of the, um, you know, all the stuff we've talked about here today, remains by far the lowest funded major transit system in North America, which, back to that transit of the year, is why I felt so strongly about it. A lot of the scoffers missed the point. We've achieved all of that in spite of being the, the, the lowest funded transit. And so, to me, that's the real question that needs to be answered, not tinkering with governance. I, th I mean, maybe that's the right way to go in the future, but you've still got to get the funding right, or you will just have the TTC, as part of a bigger organization, still struggling hand-to-mouth, year-over-year, for um, OPEX and CAPEX funding. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Michael Cobzer to address the thing. Thank you. Well, Andy, we could really tell that you still uh, love and care for this city very, very much. And um, I, I think when you say that you, you love every minute of it, um, you, 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 truly, you truly mean that. Uh, we could sense your enthusiasm about that. But I, I have to tell you, I was so impressed the very first time I saw you. I never thought I'd ever you know, sit at the same table, but I simply saw you on TV <clears throat> when you took on this job. And uh, you're being interviewed by a reporter. And one of the profound observations you had made at that time was that the TTC didn't seem to have uh, a customer service culture at all, and you wanted to impart one on the organization, for which we're, we're very, very happy that you did. And, and, uh, and I don't think Toronto, Torontonians expected a, an essential service to have to have a customer service uh, uh, culture, but, uh, but, but we can certainly see the changes that are, um, often I'll have American colleagues uh, come to, to Toronto and I always take them on the TTC and they're quick to notice these, uh, these little pleasantries like the uh, greeter uh, at the young Bloor subway station who's, uh, who's so polite and he tells people when the next train's coming and thanking them for coming to the, the TTC and they, they find that's just so Canadian, you know, to, to have somebody like that. <laughs> but if there's one thing that really demonstrates who you are. I, I think it's what you had said earlier, that you requested your own investigation on, on yourself. And what an incredible demonstration of leadership and integrity. Um, uh, that's, uh, I th it's, which is very comforting for, for, for everybody to, to know. Uh, so Andy, on behalf of the Empire Club of Canada, everybody here, and I think I could say the entire city of Toronto, thank you very much for your time and comments. Thank you. Thank you. You come back any time for a standing ovation. <laughs> I'd like to offer a sincere thank you to our generous sponsors, Siemens of Canada Limited. I can't emphasize enough that these lunches, which I think are so important to our public dialogue, just wouldn't be possible without sponsors like Siemens. So a very, very sincere thank you. I'd also like to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space, for webcasting today's event for thousands of viewers around the world so that those New Yorkers will know what to, what to expect from you, Andy, when you, when you arrive there. Although our club has been around since 1903, we have moved into the 20th century, 21st century, and we're active on social media. Please follow us on Twitter at empire underscore club, and visit us online at www.empireclub.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, 
LinkedIn, and Instagram. And finally, please join us again soon at our next event on December 6th with the Honourable Paul Martin, former Prime Minister of Canada, right here in this very location. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>